Trilobites are remarkable hard-shelled segmented creatures that existed over 520 million years ago in the Earth's ancient seas. They went extinct before dinosaurs even came into existence and are one of the key signature creatures of the Paleozoic era, the first era to exhibit a proliferation of the complex life forms that established the foundation of life as it is today. Although dinosaurs are the most well-known fossil animals, trilobites are also a favorite among those familiar with paleontology and are found in the rocks of all continents. Trilobites were among the early arthropods, a phylum of hard-shelled creatures with multiple body segments and jointed legs. They constitute an extinct class of arthropods, the Trilobita, made up of 10 orders, over 150 families, about 5,000 genera and over 20,000 described species. New species of trilobites are unearthed and described every year. This makes trilobites the single most diverse class of extinct organisms, and within the generalized body plan of trilobites, there was a great deal of diversity of size and form. Whatever their size, all trilobite fossils have a similar body plan, being made up of three main body parts, a cephalon, which is head, a segmented thorax, and a pygidium, tailpiece. However, the name trilobite, which means three-lobed, is not in reference to those three body parts mentioned before, but to the fact that all trilobites bear a long central axial lobe, flanked on each side by right and left pleural lobes. These three lobes that run from the cephalon to the pygidium are what give trilobites their name, and are common to all trilobites despite their great diversity of size and form. The dorsal morphology of trilobites is typically well preserved, but ventral features such as limbs and antenna are only rarely preserved. X-ray images of some trilobite specimens indicate a long central structure, typically considered an elementary canal, intestines or gut. Sometimes the gut or its contents are also preserved as an axial structure. Only in extremely well preserved agnostic specimens a trace of mouth and anus has been detected. The mouth is associated with the hypostome, and the anus opens toward the rear of the pygidium, as might be expected. Although they were not the first animals with eyes, trilobites developed one of the first sophisticated visual systems in the animal kingdom. The majority of trilobites had a pair of compound eyes made up of many lensed units. They typically occupied the outer edges of the fixigena, fixed cheeks, on either sides of the glabella, adjacent to the facial sutures. At least one suborder of trilobites, the agnostina, are thought to be primarily eyeless. None have ever been found with eyes. Compound eyes in living arthropods, such as insects, are very sensitive to motion, and it is likely that they were similarly important in predator detection in trilobites. It has also been suggested that stereoscopic vision was provided by closely spaced but separated eyes. Vertebrate lenses, such as our own, can change shape or accommodate to focus on objects at varying distances. Trilobite eyes, in contrast, had rigid crystalline lenses and therefore no accommodation. The two main types of compound eyes trilobites had were holocrawl and schizocrawl eyes. The main difference is that holocrawl eyes have many lenses covered by one cornea, whereas schizocrawl have many lenses, each one covered by a separate cornea. Likely, their eyes would have appeared a dark brown if we could see one alive today. Trilobite lenses were made of calcite, which is a mineral. Unlike the lenses on human eyes that are soft and able to stretch or contract to focus on things, the trilobite's hard lenses could not change shape. So how could they focus on things far away or very close without the image being blurry or having some sort of weird distortion? The answer is in the shape. The shape of both the holocrawl and the schizocrawl eye lenses, while different, achieve the same goal – the ability to see clearly without seeing ghost images at any distance. There has been a long history of speculation about the feeding habits of trilobites, ranging from predators, scavengers, filter feeders, free-swimming planktivores, and even parasites or host of chemootrophic symbionts. Using modern-day crustaceans as an analogue, it is reasonable to suggest that the majority of trilobites may have been predator scavengers, as the majority of marine crustaceans are today. The majority of early trilobites are thought to have been predators of benthic invertebrates, such as worms. Presumably, the worm was extracted, subdued and crushed or torn apart with the leg spines and strong spiny gnathobases, 
then passed forward between the legs to the anterior mouth where last processing was done against the hypostome platform before ingestion. It is suggested that species with inflated glabella, such as Phacopena, might be considered predatory, with the large glabella housing a sizable digestive chamber for initial processing of large chunks of prey. The majority of Ticoparid trilobites would fall into the category of particle feeders, suggesting that this was a prominent trophic niche for trilobites in the Cambrian and Ordovician. The simple form and small size of agnostic trilobites has led to much speculation over the nature of their biology. The majority were either small-eyed or eyeless, so they were not visual hunters. It is suggested that they might be parasitic, but this is hard to reconcile with the large numbers of individuals sometimes found. They may have been planktonic feeders, such as many ostracod crustaceans hovering in haphazard swarms or moving upward and downward in the water column according to a day-night cycle, as many small planktonic organisms do today. Among the evolutionary trends of trilobites, gigantism yielded some spectacularly large species expressed maximally in the orders Asaphida, Redlichida, and Lichida. Isotelus rex, the largest known species of trilobite at nearly three quarters of a meter in length, 720 mm, was found in Canada in a nearly complete state and can be seen at the Manitoba Museum in Winnipeg. Isotelus rex is a moderately effaced asaphid trilobite lacking terminal spines or prolongations and the holotype specimen was found in a carbonate unit showing little evidence of distortion or compaction. At about 720 mm long, 400 mm in maximum width, and 70 mm in height, it is the largest complete trilobite specimen ever found. Large representatives of Isotelus occur elsewhere in the late Ordovician succession of North America and some of the earliest described species were considered to be among the biggest trilobites then known. Prior to the discovery of the Isotelus rex, the largest confirmed complete trilobite specimen was a full articulated isotiline measuring 430 mm in length. It is from the same locality as Isotelus rex and is considered a smaller individual of that species. Most trilobites could enroll into a defensive ball or capsule via the flexible articulation of the thoracic segments, bringing the cephalon and pygidium together in a protective closed capsule that shielded the antenna, limbs, and soft ventral surface. While in that enrolled state, the trilobite could watch and wait until conditions were safer. Some groups of trilobites, for example Phacopena, developed specialized morphological features that aided enrollment, called coaptative structures. These complementary morphological features allowed close interlocking of opposing surfaces. The cephalon and pygidium of enrolled trilobites often have similar shapes that allow a tight match even to the point of special notches that fit the edges of enrolled thoracic segments and the pygidial border. Because trilobites are relatively common in the fossil record, occasionally we find various kinds of abnormalities such as asymmetrical features, healed injuries, or signs of disease. Teratology is the study of malformations or serious deviations from normal form or development, and such studies of trilobite fossils have revealed some very interesting abnormal forms. The most common types of trilobite abnormalities are partially healed injuries. Trilobites were victims of many predators in Paleozoic seas. Because an exoskeleton cannot heal until molting, abnormalities document that the trilobite survived the attack and began to heal the damaged area during its next mold. Trilobites may not look like cuddly creatures, but come mating time, one species of these now extinct arthropods, which looked like giant swimming potato bugs wearing helmets, would come together for a little hug. Scientists made the discovery after coming across an extraordinary fossil of Olenoides serratus, a trilobite species that lived about 508 million years ago during the Cambrian period. This well-preserved fossil revealed a pair of short appendages on the underside of its midsection, which were likely used as claspers. Olenoides serratus probably stationed herself on the seafloor, and then a male would mount her from above using the claspers to hold onto her body, a maneuver that would put him in the best possible mating position. This particular specimen preserved the shorter appendage pair at the midsection. This unusual leg pair is narrower and shorter than the leg pairs in front and behind it. 
What's more, these short appendages do not have spines, a hallmark on the trilobite's other legs that likely help the predator shred its food. This is the first time we are seeing a really significant specialization of appendages in trilobites. It is interesting to see that complex mating behavior had already evolved in arthropods by the mid-Cambrian. About 252 million years ago, trilobites disappeared from the fossil record. The trilobites' disappearance coincided with the end Permian extinction, also known as the Permian-Triassic extinction, the third and the most devastating mass extinction event. Volcanic eruptions in Siberia spewed enormous amounts of lava for around 2 million years. These fury eruptions sent trillions of tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere triggering ocean acidification, which in turn made it very difficult for marine animals to survive. Up to 95% of marine species succumbed to the end Permian extinction, also known as the Great Dying, including the trilobites. The trilobites, however, had already started a downward spiral toward extinction by that point. That is because environmental and evolutionary changes had whittled away at this class of creatures. When trilobites first emerged at the beginning of the Cambrian period, they were extremely diverse, potentially because they were not that many competitors. Trilobite adaptations during the early Cambrian were mainly related to growth and development, such as variations in how many segments or limbs they had. However, during the Ordovician period starting around 485 million years ago, competition and predation came more into play than it had before. Some trilobites developed different eye positioning, harder exoskeletons, or the ability to roll into a ball. These adaptations possibly made trilobites more successful on the increasingly competitive ocean floor, and in the long run, these pressures could have constrained the trilobites' recovery from the coming mass extinctions. Then came the world's first mass extinction, the Ordovician Silurian extinction around 444 million years ago, caused by a global cooling and a decrease in sea levels. The number of trilobite species, once in the thousands, dropped into the hundreds. Although food webs and ecosystems remained intact, the trilobites never quite diversify or reach the numbers they achieved previously. The second mass extinction, the late Devonian, hit the trilobites starting around 375 million years ago. The late Devonian extinction was slower and the cause less specific than the one before and after it. It is harder to study because it happened over a long interval, but it likely led to a slowing of evolution and diversification. Though the direct cause is less clear, the effect of the second extinction on the trilobites was profound. Entire orders went extinct. After the second extinction, there was only one family remaining in the class Trilobita, the Proetidae. It is unclear what made Proetidae so resilient. They were relatively simple creatures compared with some of the more massive and monstrous trilobites that have existed before. By the third extinction, the end Permian, the competition, predators and environmental changes had flipped the odds against the ancient Proetida. They could not resist the global warming events set in motion by the volcanic eruptions.